All right, here we go. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. CP here on the check-in. Tonight's guest, he's been an esteemed writer around the league for a number of publications, having recently written the critically acclaimed Tanking to the Top, a story about the Philadelphia Sixers, Sam Hinky, and the process. And just recently, he gave us an in-depth inside look at the new New York Knicks front office, Leon Rose's front office, and his name is Yaron Weitzman. Yaron, thanks for joining me today, man. How you doing? Thank you. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, man. So, honestly, this is probably one of the best pieces I've read on the Knicks all year, you know, all season, <laughs> because, you know, we just never had that inside look into the front office. We had our glimpses here and there, but not to this level. So, great job on the piece. Um, what what sprung you to, to write it? Um, that's, that's a good question. I know you sent that to me. Um, the short answer is like, I, I had it right. I know that's like an oversimplification. Like yeah. I thought and knew, you know, I had some good reporting and I thought it was relevant. Um, you know, I guess to get, make it a little bigger part of the thing, this front office is becoming very known for not communicating their mm-hmm. plans outwardly. I'd be curious to get your thoughts, right. As a Knicks fan, mm-hmm. um, like the, if Leon Rose has not had a press conference at all. I think he was with Thibodeau for like, you know, a minute on that joint one. Um, and they sent a note to season ticket holders. So that kind of puts more of an impetus to go find out, okay, but like, what's the actual plan? We don't know yeah. the actual plan. We kind of hear things. And he sent that letter to season ticket holders, which was basically paint by numbers for like what a GM, new GM or team president says to fans, right? right. We're going to culture, build the future, presence present uh draft picks stars we're gonna do this and that it's just a bunch of you know gobbledygook it's nothing right it's nothing specific um so yeah that combination of like being interested in that and thinking that i had some answers um yeah made me want to put it out i would say you know in in terms of leon and and not really speaking out to the fans you know like you said you you hear the common jargon you know we're gonna rebuild we're gonna put a winner out there we want our track stars all, all the common lingo i think it's just important for me to to hear them come out and just be show some transparency of, you know, to a certain extent. Obviously, you know, they're not going to put all their cards out on the table, but you want to know a clear-cut strategy, a a clear-cut approach to how you're going to build this thing. So far, you just hear a little bit of everything, and you're not really sure. And that's why, you know, your article, you want to, you know, dig into that because you want to get some sort of idea of which direction are they going in. But at the same time, you know, just come out when you need to. You know, come out when you need to. Uh, Here's the transaction we made. Here's why we did it. Here's how we feel like it's going to position us, you know, in the future. Yeah, it's interesting. And like, you know, I didn't fully unpack. I don't think in the article, like I I was showing a lot of how decisions were being made. Um, I don't know if I fully have the answers. Clearly, listen, in the offseason, clearly they followed the... I'll call it the Brock Aller path. That puts maybe too much on. I mean, as Leon Rose is in charge, right? But yeah. the the more Sam Hinkie like uh, rebuild, right? We're mm-hmm. gonna only do one year guys. They didn't chase Russell Westbrook. They made like the Ed Davis trade where we're taking second round picks for him and flipping him off and things like that. But it's not like like you know Thibodeau was pushing for Gordon Hayward. But there are other reports out there as an example that they actually off- offered Hayward some money, yeah. right? Just mm-hmm. maybe not a big contract. So mm-hmm. it's not like they completely sat things out. Um, so I, I don't know if they fully had the were on or I don't know if the plan was fully thought out. Right, the examples I give is a couple of things. One, the reporting mm-hmm. we know on Leon Rose. I don't believe this was something that Leon Rose was always dreaming of to be a to be a GM. Like you know, I think of Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr, when he was before he became a head coach, spent years in the broadcast booth, like compiling like, compiling a notebook of mm-hmm. ideas and schemes and things like that. I don't think Leon Rose was doing that. My understanding is the Knicks kind of reached out to him and said, Hey, do you want this? Like, I don't think Leon Rose had like a deck or PowerPoint saved, like my five year plan to rebuild the Knicks that yeah. he was ready to whip out for James Dolan, right? Um, so I don't know. And maybe at some point he did put that together. I don't know if he did, mm-hmm. right? It's not necessarily the read I've got it. I don't know, but that's not really like, I don't think that some plan that he pitched Dolan led to him being hired. I think it seemed like it was more of tapped, hey, we like Leon. He's smart. He can be our leader in this. We'll bring him in. We'll figure the other stuff out. Um, so it's an interesting thing, the plan. And clearly, yeah. you know, and I had this in the story, Brock Aller and Tom Thibodeau were not on the same page in terms of how to advance into the during the offseason, what moves to make. That can be okay for that's normal often in teams with like the example I give is Toronto Raptors now, let's say, right. Where it'd be very normal for that group to be saying, Hey, should we trade Lowry and these guys or should Mm -hmm. we rebuild? And somebody might think a, somebody might think B 
for new hires to be brought in by a new team president and not be on the same page there, that's a little weird to me. Yeah, it's it's just interesting, you know, in terms of how he put it together because when he first started making the hires, you know, we brought on people. We brought in Mark to talk about Leon. We brought in the Kentucky beat writers to talk about World Wide West and Kenny Payne, and mm -hmm. I brought in Utah Jazz beat writers to talk about Johnny Bryant. But it was just interesting to see, you know, how they were all going to come together and whose voice was really going to reign supreme. And in this article, it just seems like it's World Wide West, man. It seems <laughs> like it's World Wide West really running this show and really the one that's in Leon's ear. I mean, you, you talked about how, uh, you know, influential he was in, in bringing Quickly on, you know, the Quickly draft pick and, and some of the other antics that were going on behind the scenes. What did you make of, of uh, Leon, I mean, World Wide West after you had done this piece? Yeah, so someone phrased this to me. Now the next, like, you know, tie goes to West, right? That yeah. might be the best way to summarize it. Yeah. Um, yeah, the West thing is fascinating, and that's that's the unique part in this, in the, that I, that is not comparable to any other front office because there's no one comparable to World Wide West in the entire NBA ecosystem, right? They're just like, he, he is one of a kind. There's mm -hmm. nothing else like him. In terms of what his skills are, like, he's not a scout. I don't yeah. know what, I, I, his skills are relationship. relationship I, builder, I had to describe right? his title in the, yeah, I described his title in the post, I think in the article I did like, you know, four slashes, right? It's mm -hmm. not, you can't just do one word to describe him. Um, so there's that. And then also his relationship with Leon, those two are so close and connected over the past 30 years in a way where again, I don't know if you can find any two people in the NBA ecosystem who've, climb that high who are as connected to each other it's almost like rich paul and lebron if rich paul had more of a hand and yeah. not to disparage rich paul but if rich paul had more of a hand in pulling lebron up to where he is right it's like there's not even a comparison where leon and west they both pulled each other up equally right or some mm -hmm. would even say west helped leon more than the other way around i don't know if i would necessarily agree um but just so that that relationship, like number one, number two, Leon's obviously in charge, but the West thing, it's just like, yeah, he's going to have the ear, obviously. Um, I'm saying obviously, you no, know, it's kind of thing we all know, but if yeah. you hear the stories. That said, like, and this is where, you know, I've been being asked these questions. I don't necessarily have the answers because he pushed quickly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he was pushing other guys and like Nick Richards, they didn't draft. Mm -hmm. I had in the story that he was really pushing Nick Richards mm -hmm. and they didn't draft him. I had Maybe a feeling Leon that, that doing... they would have been looking at him, but yeah. Yeah, so maybe Leon is doing some discerning there. I don't know the full answers there. And the quickly thing's fascinating too, because like, you know, they liked Maxi, but Wes pushed quickly more than Maxi. Two Kentucky guards basically mm. draft. Uh, Maxi was ranked higher than quickly, right? Like, we'll say basically equal coming into the draft, right? I mean, yeah. give or take. But those are two e of equal standing, right? Kentucky guards. Um, Leon cho uh, Wes chose one or the other, so maybe there's something skilled there. I don't know. It's yeah. really interesting. It's just going to be really interesting to kind of pay attention to as time moves on here. For sure. And, and you know, I don't mind the relationships factor and, and Wes even having a voice. We, we know that, you know, a lot of these younger kids and the younger generation, they love him. You know, they, they, they vouch for World Wide West. He, he's their guy. But I just hope that they're making the proper basketball decisions, especially when it comes to the draft and not just looking at, well, he knows this guy. We know this guy. We know this mm -hmm. guy. Because the OB thing is perplexing to me. Because when we are going into this draft, I had heard that Randall would have been on the block. And so when they made the OB pick, it made me feel like, okay, there's a good chance of this happening because I couldn't see them, you know, keeping both. And now you have in your piece, you said that Tibbs was a little bit um, doubtful on Randall in the beginning. And now you have him turning this around into an all-star season. His future with the Knicks, uh, you have to figure that they're going to look to keep him. But then you have the OB pick looming large. And it doesn't seem at this point in time, at this early stage, that they can even complement each other on the court for an extended period of time. So that's, that's the thing with me with Wes and with Rose and, you know, how they're picking these kids. I just hope it's with the best intentions from a basketball standpoint and not just based on who they know. Correct. And, and what I think they would say is the who they know part is like, let's say quickly, I'm assuming what Wes would say is it's not just, and I don't know if I agree, I, I agree with you, but I'm assuming what Wes would say is it's not just that I know quickly. It's that I know so much about him and I see something in him that others don't. And mm -hmm. therefore I can say he's being undervalued. Right. And that mm -hmm. he's actually X and not Y to me. That's the thing. Like, you know, they would say they had more information, but I agree with you. Right. If we're going to focus on the quickly pick, you got to focus on the OB pick and mm -hmm. the OB pick is strange. And I thought it was strange, 
you know, I'm going to pat myself on the back. I'm wrong all the time. Right? <laughs> but I thought it was strange even before the season, before knowing Randall was this, because he played, it's the same. They're all these guys in the same positions, right? You're playing even RJ, I guess RJ is a ball handler, but these are mm-hmm. bigger guys. These are front, I don't know, wings of fours or whatever, like guys with Kevin Knox and RJ and, Mitchell Robbins and OB, these are a lot of guys who are overlapping in different ways. I know Mitchell's a five, but they're just, these are positional overlaps in mm-hmm. terms of, and, that's, and guys who maybe can't be on the floor together because of the shooting thing, which is a big problem. Um, you combine that with one of OB Toppin's biggest strengths was, you know, he was NBA ready. That was a thing. I don't watch college basketball. I don't know. This was the thing that draft people said. He was yeah. NBA ready and he was older than other guys. So he was had the right. NBA ready skills yeah. and he was just more ready to play. Clearly, I mean, he, I'll say he was, I know it's been injuries, but like, he's not being treated like somebody who's NBA ready. And when he does play, he's standing in the corner on the weak side is like a floor spacer. Right. So right. It's, it's, yeah, that part's been weird. I agree. Yeah, I agree. And, and uh, you know, when they, when it comes to writing publications, as you know, they always say that there's a wow moment, you know, there's a wow moment that, that, you know, when you're doing your research, you know, that thing that you come across that just blows you away. Uh, what was it when doing this piece? I think you said you had reached out to 12. 12 people contributed to this piece yeah i mean more than that but okay. yeah i think that was the number i put in like mm-hmm. you know again i've been talking to people about the knicks mm-hmm. for months now since leon came in mm-hmm. um yeah i mean the west stuff i think it's the west stuff. i find that the most fascinating just it's this what does worldwide west as team executive in the nba look like right yeah. that to me is it so oh, I sh- i'll say two parts actually right mm-hmm. the west stuff i find is fascinating because west is just this fascinating nba character we all know but we don't know like yeah. everyone knows oh yeah wex but no one actually knows what yeah he does or who he is he's a mystery man. um yeah exactly so hearing about what that actually looked like with him in an nba front office from the interesting like pushing quickly and having thoughts about kentucky guys to the um eccentric we'll say like you know uh revealing his bare chest like not on purpose not mm-hmm. purposely revealing his bare chest but changing a shirt while on a zoom call right and right right everyone's seeing him bare chested um <laughs> or like bringing or bringing key lime pies to the pot to a draft that he loves because he's so excited like they're just these are different kind of courts and yeah. i love that stuff right yeah. um that and then again the the, the brock aller Thibodeau preseason offseason um clashing i found mm-hmm. just revealing in terms of and again I, and this time a lot of this stuff is kind of hinted at in other reporting um, around the time too, right? Like the Hayward stuff and all that. Right. But the idea that there wouldn't be a clear vision direction of among all new hires for a new regime, even four months, whatever it was, six months into it. Like that seems to me something that, you know, everyone comes in and would be on the same page. And to me, that was a little strange that it did not seem to be the case. Yeah. And, and as you said, because you, you have Tibbs who is known to be a win now guy. He wants to lean on his vets. The Hayward stuff was out there. You also said Marcus Morris. He was interested in, in, in extending or pot- or potentially Bogdan Bogdanovich, who I would have liked to have seen on this team as well. So I definitely don't blame him. I heard Malik Beasley's name being thrown around as well. And then on the other side, you have... Uh, your capologist, your, your guy who believes in doing things on the margins and, and uh, you know, the one-year deals and potentially flipping for future assets and just kind of building that war chest. I just wonder at what point does that come to a head? You know, that's, they're, the, they're talking that's the big question. Or, right? It's Beal, it's Booker, it's Donovan, and, and all these guys are in... I mean, when you look at Booker and Donovan, they're in set situations. Their teams are at the top of the West. I don't see any realistic scenario where these guys are made available in the in the near future. So I just – it goes back to the strategy, right? Like what is the long-term vision for, for this group? Now, so that that's the question, right? And, the, and, you know, Booker, these are the guys that everyone was talking about. When Leon Rose got hired, yeah. right, like mentioning them. But I'm with you. Like it's hard – you know, maybe their next contracts are with different teams, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe they don't, maybe they don't, next, they don't re-sign the contracts with Phoenix and Utah. Um, but that's what we four years away already from, yeah, that, from that right, happening. Right. Anyway, and that's, that's a, and that's a, and that's, that sounds like a long time and mm-hmm. even longer than it sounds, especially in today's NBA, where yeah. it's more like the NFL where like every two years, everything flips over. Right. Um, yeah. So I agree with you. I do not think this front office is, you know, here for a five year rebuilding plan. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I'd say is Julius Randall's, emer- I don't think it can be overstated. What if this is legit, especially the shooting, right? Mm-hmm. How that changes the outlook here. Um, because if you have that and you have a legitimate number two guy, which right now, the way he's played right now, he is that right. Yeah. Like a legitimate number two guy. Yeah. Um, 
So, I mean, maybe you want to say number three on a championship team, but he's a number two guy. So mm-hmm. if you have that and suddenly you combine that with your cap room and with your picks and with that, some of these young players, RJ's look better. Yeah. And Mitchell Robinson is, you know, he's been okay. Um, also, like the cupboard's not bare, right? And then right. you have, then you bring in the relationships and you say, okay, maybe these guys will come here. And it just, it's funny how the emergence of one player can change the entire outlook. And that might mm-hmm. be the kind of thing that, you know, it's a little luck that they inherited that. I don't really know that this front office did much to make Julius Randle what he is. Mm-hmm. Thibodeau's organization certainly helped in terms of organizing the offense and mm-hmm. communication. I know the Knicks brought in Kenny Payne, that helped Randle, though, you know, I've been joking like, I think if the Knicks, the day they officially hired Kenny Payne, Rand, like, you know, Randall, that would have been the most crazy four day boot camp for him to have gotten Randall in that kind of shape in like the amount of time yeah. there was between his official hiring and beginning a mini camp, right? Yeah. So it can't all be on Kenny Payne. Um, but, you know, you inherit that luck and then you make the right moves. And this, the situation, they're in a decent situation here, which is interesting and mm-hmm. did not look like that was the case a year ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. And, you know, in terms of how this front office kind of stacks up with the rest, you know, you study the league for some time now. Outside of the World Wide West factor, the way I kind of looked at, you know, the the hiring of Mike Woodson, Kenny Payne, Johnny Bryant, it seemed like to me that they were looking at those guys as more of the player development, you know, helping these guys, you know, matriculate through the program and, and, and uh, as they mature under Tibbs. But that will allow Tibbs to focus on the X's and O's, focus on the present and, and uh, you know, winning. But the Johnny Bryants, the Kenny Paints, and Mike Woodsons would really be the guys that are going to help these guys, you know, develop their skill sets and, and really be that, that player development focus. How do you see that composition of that group? compared to to the rest of the league that's interesting so the assistant coach thing that makes sense what you're saying i might have any idea i'm not around we're not around i we are not around the team it's so hard to make these kind of calls now like you know we're not on the court you don't see these things the same way Mm -hmm. just not being in practice it's it's hard to get weeds on those things Mm -hmm. what i will say is i agree with you it's more typical to leon rose right and this is this is the optimistic version of the kind of story i put out where i joke it's like a rorschach test for Mm -hmm. Knicks fans depends like you see what you want to see but like the optimistic version is Thibodeau's going to be Thibodeau. He's going to be banging on the door all day. Get me this, get me this, get me this. And we've seen him before, and he mm-hmm. clashes with front offices. He's clashed with other front offices in the past, and he wants to win. Um, and even, like, I had a piece in the quote, um, you know, someone who's known Thibodeau for a long time, I quoted them as saying, you know, it's not that he lies. It's that, you know, he says one thing and then comes in and he gets us all consumed with winning in the next game. Mm-hmm. Um, but the counter to that is, okay, but Leon Rose will say, yeah, okay, cool, you do that, but we're so close. I'm going to say no to you. It's just, it's just really interesting, right? In a way that Thibodeau and Leon Rose's relationship is just different. And that might be the key here. And that might be the key to unlocking a different type of Thibodeau that we've seen in, than we've seen in previous years, um, where, or in his previous stints, I should say. And this is the pitch. This is what Leon Rose is. I mean, he's not saying because he doesn't talk to anybody, but I think this is the idea that, you know, we're going to be like a family. We're going to might not all get along. Excuse me. We might not all agree all the time. We might argue sometimes. But it's cool because we have these relationships and we'll, we'll be able to get over it. Um, you know, sometimes families don't work well together. Yeah. They're going to business together. We'll have <laughs> right. to, you know, it's, it's the question. I don't, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? It's really, it'll be, it's going to be fascinating to watch. It is a different sort of NBA experiment, I believe. I don't know that we've seen i mean you know people get along but i don't know that we've seen examples of this before yeah yeah certainly certainly bears watching and uh you know throughout reading the piece you you hear about obviously World Wide west you hear leon rose you hear brock Oller, but you don't really hear much about scott perry you know scott perry's fans you got i gotta say the fans are there are the fans are very like what does this mean about scott yeah, perry what does it mean because you know you have walt perrin the assistant gm you have all the hair who's obviously in his ear Wes, it seems like he's the number two guy but you have perry here he made the morris trade to to get quickly or i mean to get the draft pick that led to quickly you know the the porzingis trade even in the beginning looked a little murky but now we'll see maybe porzingis gifts us another lottery pick this year so where do you see Scott Perry kind of fitting in this mix? Yeah, Scott Perry, he's like, you know, I joke, like, you know, there's in the room and then there's the room within the room. He's yeah. in that room within the room still. Like, he's got a voice or he's he's present, I should say. He's, you know, his voice is valued. Um, I don't think it's the main voice, right? Um, and why, I mean, that wouldn't be surprising to anybody. Yeah. Um, 
you know, Wes would be above him and these other people, the other people who Leon knows, Brock Allen, I don't know about above him, but I think my, they, they like, first of all, Scott Perry was, if I have this right, I believe he had one more year on his contract anyway. Yeah, right, he, he did. Came in. Mm-hmm. So, so that, I mean, not to be, uh, you know, what's what, over practical about it, but that definitely played a role. Yeah. Um, and he, they value him. They value his role. He's a, Leon Rose and Worldwide West have never worked for an NBA team before, right? Scott Perry is a life, is a lifer in terms of NBA front offices, has been a GM for multiple teams, the Kings and the Knicks, mm-hmm. um, meaning the job that they don't have, that they don't know. He knows how to do the job. He knows how to do it in New York. He's got lots of connections throughout the league. People like him. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, I don't know. He has a GM title. I don't know if it's the classic GM role. I mean, the titles these days are all fun. Like, you know, Leon Rose is operating as the GM. We call him the president of basketball operations, mm-hmm. but it's the classic term as the GM. The titles in the NBA are all different now. So Scott Perry's in the room and he's involved. Um, I don't think it'd be like, you know, shocking to say that he is not, you know, if he pounds his table, his hand on the table during the draft, maybe he'd be listened to if he was yeah. really emphatic <laughs> about a guy. I don't know that it, his voice carries that much weight. And I don't think like, I don't think that's offensive to say. I think it's a matter of fact, right? Mm-hmm. This is not his group. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now you've covered this team in the past and, and you're covering this team now. Has your perception changed in terms of, direction of the Knicks you know it's been a lot of nightmares over this last 20 years you 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 claimed you were a fan no longer a fan but but, <laughs> but has your perception changed with this team um yeah I was lapsed when I became a journalist and I joke I saw how the sausage was made right oh. so that says, oh, I'm good um no you know else you're not supposed to but that's a yeah. separate thing um by the way just because I know Knicks fans I know plenty by saying I that doesn't mean I have an agenda against the Knicks yeah right? okay, okay I was okay. always the I was always a fan, by the way. Like, I hated everything they did. Like, I was the cynical. You know, there are yeah. two types of Knicks fans. There's the ones who think, I'll go back to Stefan Marbury trade. Yeah. That was when I was growing up. They're the yeah. ones who thought Stefan Marbury was, like, the savior. And, yes. God, he was amazing. Yeah. And they were the ones who realized this was not going to end well. Right. And I was the one who realized it was not going to end well. <laughs> um, you, know, year, you know, years of New York sports fandom. T- it, like, I joke. Like, someone, I have a friend who calls me a cynic. I'm like, no, I'm just experienced as a New York fan. Yeah, right? yeah. That's, like, that's not cynicism. Battle tested, um, yeah, Battle tested. Yeah. It's like, I've seen this movie before. Um, anyway, so you asked how I feel about them um, or my what I think the outlook is. Again, I really, the Randall thing changes a lot. Mm-hmm. I, if, if he's legit, I think they're going to be actually in a good position here, right? Because they have the cap room. They have some picks. Um, RJ looks better. Um, I, I am, you know, I'm editorializing my reporting now. Mm-hmm. I would say I'd be a little concerned about some of the internal processes, you know, process versus results. I don't know if the internal processes are great. Um, I'd be a little concerned about that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we all hop on the quickly thing, which is great. But like you pointed out, or we pointed out the OB pick, not so great. Um, maybe there was, and I don't know, I guess Halliburton would be the one guy you would say they should have taken. It sometimes can be dangerous to do the thing where you find the guy who went 14 and say everybody. Yeah, Monday morning Monday quarterback. I, I thought Halliburton yeah, or like Vassell, the, but yeah, yeah. It's just, so it's not like the draft's a crapshoot. Yeah, it the is, draft's yeah. hard, right? So mm-hmm. it's just, so if, you, but it, so, but if you picked OB, you know, at the time, nobody thought that was a bad pick. I think right. people laughed a little bit because the Knicks might have taken him at number four. I'm exaggerating, but maybe not. Like, it was always yeah. going to be the Knicks pick, but at, at number eight, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, I'd be a little worried about the processes, but, man, they might work, right? And, like, I think if you're a Knicks fan, you could feel pretty good. First of all, enjoy it. Yeah. 19 and 18. I mean, they're only two games or two and a half games above 11. We'll leave that part out. <laughs> <laughs> that's hard. Yeah. Um, and they've had lots of, you know, they had an easy schedule and they haven't had any COVID issues or injuries and, a point, you know, been documented teams are missing a ton of threes against them. They're giving up a ton mm-hmm. of threes and teams are, that's usually something that is statistically teams don't have much control over in terms right. of how opponents shoot from three point line. Um, but if you watch them, you see, this is a different team than years past. Thibodeau has them organized and playing a different way than they've played in, I don't know, five years. Like when was the last coach that had them playing this type of organized yeah. and disciplined basketball? Yeah, yeah. Um, and cohesive basketball. So I think there's reasons for optimism. I'm repeating, it goes back, the Randall thing changes everything. And if he's legit, you know, the free agent market stinks, but I don't know. I like Lonzo Ball. I'm making this up. But, you know, there, there are young guys out there who maybe you overpay for and you overpay for them because they're young and you bring in and you see what kind of happens. So I think, like, I, I do think there's a light at the end of the tunnel here that you can see. Yeah, I, I can certainly see that. And as you said, as the war chest builds, um, you definitely like what the future holds. I just hope that when they're drafting these kids, these kids actually get a chance to play because as it looks with That's, Thibodeau yeah. right now, if you're not ready from day one like IQ, 
you're not going to get those minutes. And OB right now, he's hovering between that 10 to 12 minute mark and he's gone. Whether he's playing well or he's playing poorly, his minutes are, are, are capped. IQ, on the other hand, he'll get his chance depending on the situation. So it just seems like whoever they draft, it can't be any projects. This kid has to be ready to go and to produce because at the at the time when they're ready to to flip that button and and make that flip, they've got to have assets that are actually worth you know trading for, or else it's going to cost uh, a lot I, more. I, I and I agree. Like, so again, this is like I'll present both sides. Mm-hmm. My personal opinion, I agree with you. Like if I. I find I text Nick fans that like friends of mine. And like, when I see Taj Gibson, and Derek Rose closing games, I text it being like, this is playing <laughs> for the future. Huh? This is what you want to see. Um, so I agree with you. I don't think that's necessarily the greatest strategy. Like maybe you don't have to hand people minutes, but like this Taj Gibson need to be getting fourth quarter minutes, Right. but there are people in the league. Was it David Griffin recently was quoted. I mean, they're struggling too, but I think he was quoted about saying a similar type of thing that like, you don't want people to earn their minutes. You don't want to just give it to them. Um, this is not a, you know, Thibodeau's not the only one who believes that. Again, I disagree with it personally, but maybe they're right. Maybe yeah. he's right. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly wait and see, man. But, Yaron, I, I definitely want to congratulate you on that piece. I, I encourage Knicks fans to read it because it's really in-depth and gives you a different look into this Knicks front office that we didn't have going into this. So, great job, continued success, and, and thanks for joining the show, man. Hopefully, we'll get you on a post-game show. When you become a Knicks fan again and, and you really embrace that orange and blue, <laughs> yeah. we'll get you on a post-game show and, and, and wrap on another level, man. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't wait for the uh, fandom part. But I'll come on anytime. I'll give you. I'll spit fire. I'll give you everything, man. I'll give you it all. Don't worry. But uh, I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thanks again, man. All the best.